morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Lord's Day. We are celebrating today the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Now, just a couple of comments before we begin our service. We first of all welcome all of you here this day, also who may be watching us online as well. Thank you for joining us on this day. Um, we will be having a shortened service today and for the following two Sundays as well. As part of our congregation's self-study, we will be undertaking, beginning today, a Bible study in connection with our church service. So we'll try to keep the service itself short so there's enough room in there for Holy Communion and also for our Bible study. Uh, one of the things that came to mind just before I, I walked out this morning is um, conducting a Bible study in a worship service can be a little difficult because you're used to just sitting, maybe singing a hymn or joining me in a prayer, but you're not used to asking questions or making comments regarding things that we're looking at. So as we move into the Bible study, I hope that you can shift gears in your thinking as well from a worship service to a Bible study because it is meant to be interactive. Uh, with that, uh, oh, one other thing, uh, for Holy Communion today, uh, the elders at our last um, meeting uh, had determined that we would go back to uh, normal communion distribution beginning today, with one exception, out of respect for COVID concerns, you'll notice that there is no common cup up here and there will not be for the foreseeable future it will be just the wafers and the individual cup for the foreseeable future with that in mind with all those things in mind dear ones let's join together join our hearts together and sing our praises to our great god and savior with the opening hymn i know my faith is founded <laughs>
come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Dear ones, there is good news. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you may be seated. We'll turn our attention to our uh, sermon text for today, which once again comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. We're looking at the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you, that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you, and that our labors might have been in vain. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, dear friends, uh, we come in our study of Paul's uh, first letter to the first letter to Thessalonians to the first portion of uh, a very personal part, really, you might say, of the letter, uh, where Paul speaks very almost fatherly in a fatherly way to the Thessalonians. But it's a beautiful section, folks, and I'd like to look at it with you today for just these few minutes using the theme, encouraging one another to stand firm. So what's interesting here is um, the Apostle Paul refers to Satan a couple times in these short, uh, in these verses. He begins by talking about, uh, he just rehearses very quickly with them, uh, what had happened again uh, and why they had become separated. He had spent, and you and I have looked at this, we, he spent about three weeks or so with the Thessalonians, had to flee for his life, ended up, this is way up in the north country in Macedonia and Greece, ended up fleeing all the way to Athens, where he could lose himself in a crowd and, would, and that was successful with that, and then eventually made his way to Corinth, where he met Aquila and Priscilla, tent makers like he was, and as they worked together, uh, making tents, they also worked together sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and during that time, Paul wrote these two letters to the congregation in Thessalonica. And he talks about the fact that even though he had been, uh, actually the word doesn't, uh, uh, orphaned is, is one way of putting it, actually it means to be torn, he was torn away from them. 
This was absolutely not in his plans, and yet it happened. And he tried, after he'd been separated from them again and again, to get back to them, to encourage them, to strengthen them in their faith. And he says, but Satan hindered me. Isn't that interesting? Satan hindered me. The word that Paul uses there is very interesting. It's actually a military term. When it was first started being used, it meant to, for an invading army, to break up the road that they were traveling on so that anyone who would try to counterattack them would be hindered in, make, in their effort to try to catch up to them. It actually got used much later on uh, for an athlete, a runner, in a race, cutting in front of somebody else and hindering that second person from getting ahead. But we don't know how, how Paul was hindered by Satan. But that's not the point. The point is Satan was successful in keeping Paul away from his people, his people in Thessalonica. This all has to do, folks, with the beautiful concept that we call Christian fellowship. And just as Satan was successful for a time in hindering the Apostle Paul from being together with his brothers and sisters in Thessalonica, so Satan has been very successful also in the Christian church throughout the years, right down to you and me. Working at, trying in some way to infiltrate the fellowship of believers, all with the intent of separating that fellowship, also with our God, in fact. And like I said, he's been so incredibly successful with this. Again and again, we come up with, with reasons why we do not fellowship with our God, meet with him here at church. Again and again, we come up with things. How many times have you heard it said, well, if that's the way they feel, I'm not ever coming back to church there again. Or something like that. And every time, dear ones, Satan puts his hands together. Every time he's successful. Oh, good. Because he understands, dear ones, that no matter how strong you and I are individually, God and the blessing of the Holy Spirit and this fellowship of believers makes us so much stronger, exponentially stronger, when we stand together, four square, on the faith that he has worked in each of us, Trusting in this God to extend to you the likes of you and me a forgiveness that is beyond incredible. Absolutely beyond incredible. To come together, dear ones, and to hear that simple, the words that I spoke just a few minutes ago. To declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To stand in awe of this God who continues to extend that promise to you and me. And then, dear ones, together to share that message with the world around us that desperately needs it and is lost without it. And every time Satan's hindering activity gets, gains success in you and me and our relationship with God, or in our relationship with one another. Satan is thrilled. Well, Paul mentions, like I said, he mentions him twice, and we have to get going. Um, Paul mentions Satan twice in this, um, in this section. It's actually in the last verse. He doesn't call him Satan again. He calls him another name. He calls him the tempter. And he talks about the tempter's temptations. And he's, he's concerned. He wants to get back to the, to the believers there in Thessalonica because he's concerned that somehow Satan's temptations, the tempter's temptations, had been successful in the hearts and lives of those Thessalonian believers 
and was somehow cutting the legs out from underneath them. Now, you and I know temptations come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, lots of times when we think about temptation, we think about the way that Jesus described them in the parable of the sower and seed, the worries, riches, and pleasures of this world, and that's absolutely true. It seems here that Paul has more in mind another list of Satan's temptations. You'll find them, dear ones, in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. And there John, who is writing the book of Revelation, really is the penman, you might say, for the Lord Jesus. Because it's the Lord Jesus in chapters 2 and 3 talking to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he talks to them, dear ones, not about worldly temptations, but in this case what I would call spiritual temptations. How the Ephesians have lost their first love how the Laodiceans had become lukewarm. How the folks in Pergamum had compromised the only truth that can set someone free. The truth is, is found only in Jesus. Compromise that for whatever the reason. Or others who had become just simply complacent. Well, if I don't do this today, I can do that tomorrow kind of a thing. This is what Paul was concerned about with his Thessalonian believers, dear ones. And why he writes to them like he does in this section. It's always important, folks, for you and me to have a healthy respect for this adversary, Satan, the devil, the tempter. Luther said it, right? On earth is not as equal. And that's absolutely the truth. But at the same time, dear ones, you and I, by God's grace and mercy, dare never forget that there is one to whom even Satan will bow. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ when He comes again in His glory. He has already destroyed death. And how did he destroy that, folks? How did he destroy one of Satan's best weapons? In his weakness. By himself dying. And in his weakness, in his death, crushing. It's a beautiful picture from God speaking to his first creation in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve crushing Satan's head. This is our God. This is the one we've come here this day to worship. This is the one we've come today to meet in His Word and in the sacrament that you and I might be refreshed and strengthened so that together you and I might rejoice in the salvation that God has given to us in Jesus. Oh, and dear ones, join together in sharing that gospel with the people around us. Paul wrote these words at the end of chapter 2. He said, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Could the same thing be said by you about our fellowship of believers here at St. Mark's? Should it be said by you and me about our fellowship of believers here at St. Mark's? And the blessing of the Holy Spirit, yes, indeed. And may it be so, dear ones, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand? May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'd like you please now to join with me in one of the ancient creeds of the Christian church, the Nicene Creed. We'll join together 
as an expression of our faith this day. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. Please rise for prayer. We, Lord, would lay at thy behest the costliest offerings on thy shrine, but when we give and give our best, we give thee only what is thine. O Father, whence all blessings come. O Son, dispenser of God's store. O Spirit, bear our offerings home. Lord, make them thine forevermore. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this fellowship of believers that you've granted to us here at St. Mark's, all in the blessing of your Holy Spirit. A powerful, Lord, declaration of the work of your Holy Spirit in the hearts and lives of people like us. We pray, O oh Lord, your grace and blessing as we continue forward, dear Lord, that you'd help us together to work for you, O oh Lord, to your glory and praise and for the spread of your holy name throughout the world and for the strengthening of our faith and the faith of our children and grandchildren here at St. Mark's. Oh Lord, thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus and the salvation you've provided for all of us through his shed blood. It is a most incredible message and we pray your grace and blessing, O oh Lord, on it until he returns in glory. Hear us for his sake, O oh Lord. We pray also for our sister in Christ, Gwen Chernagel, as she continues uh, at home. We're grateful that she can be at home. 
We pray your grace and blessing on her and on Marty Clindworth as they continue to deal with health-related challenges. Above all, dear Lord, grant them the confidence that you will never leave them or forsake them. These and all of our requests we bring to you in the blessed name of Jesus as we join together in his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night on which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
Dear ones, may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you in Jesus. Amen. So if you would please, uh, we'll take just a second here. The ushers are coming forward and they're going to distribute the, the Bible study uh, that we'll be using for these next three Sundays. <clears throat> uh, you are welcome, please, to write down notes, comments, questions. Um, I think there's a little bit of room on the back page of the Bible study, if you would like to uh, do that, uh, take some notes there, put some notes down. We'll be using this for the next three Sundays, so we're asking if you would please, uh, at the conclusion of the service today, if you just put this in your mailbox out here, and then it'll be um, here and ready for us for these for these next two Sundays. We do have a few extra copies, also in case you um, happen to forget it, take it home and forget about it. I don't have a remote control thing to advance the slides, so Meredith Milbrath will be my remote control. And uh, she'll advance. There's just a few slides. Uh, there aren't too many of them, so, but she'll be the one. So if you'll allow me, please, I'll just say, next, Meredith, and she'll go to the next slide, okay? So if you would, please, uh, we'll turn to that opening page, and we'll begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we so thank you for this fellowship of believers that we call St. Mark's. The, those who have gone before us, O oh Lord, and in your strength and in the blessing of your good spirit laid a foundation, a foundation that has stood the test of time and has come down to this day and continues to provide the message of hope and life to our community and to us as members here of St. Mark's. We pray your grace and blessing, O Lord, that this faith of our fathers that you have handed down to us, unworthy as we are, that you might use us, dear Lord, to continue to proclaim your truth to the next generations and to the community around us so that all the world, or at least in our little area here in Mankato and environs, might at least have the opportunity to come to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Hear us for his sake. Amen. So, if you would please, with that, we will take a look at the three boxes that you have there on the top of your first page we're just kind of leading in actually this is a lead in to our first study for today if you would please define and or give characteristics of these three things a task a job a mission so what would you call a task Like I said, you had, you had at the beginning of the service, now we got to switch gears because it's okay for you to talk now and ask questions, Ram. Right? Like, um, Excellent. Good. Um, very, uh, very spot on. Let's see. What does he give here for? Uh, I can't read it. Uh, we often think of tasks as being shorter or one-time activities, not ongoing. Just what Robin just said, right? A task might be something that is assigned, like a task when I was teaching at MBL, I would assign a task to the students. Or you might assign a task um, to your children or your grandchildren to do the dishes or take out the garbage or something like that. Good. How about a job? How would you define a job? Characteristic of a job. Paper. Say it again. Paper. Okay. Paper. S 
spot on. A job, let's take a fancy term for that. It's a vocation. That's the fancy term for it. It's what you've been doing. Look at a number of folks who are my age and what we used to do for a living. Many of us, what we're still doing for a living as an example of, of what we would call a job. So this is something that might involve tasks, right? There are a number of things that you did in the course of fulfilling your job, but those individual things or tasks were only part and parcel of, of that job. How about a mission? Define a mission. A goal. Goal and a purpose. Excellent. And we're going to obviously be focusing uh, much more on a mission. And, and he has here, a mission is greater in scope, more important than a job. It is also something that is given to you by superiors. So that might be something that you want to add into that thought of, of a mission, as something that's given to you by a superior. Why? So the question that he asked is, why is it important that we keep these things straight? And what would happen if you thought of a task as a mission, or what would happen if you thought of a mission as a task? Bob. One and done. And getting that confused. And getting that confused. Yes. I like that. Excellent. Excellent. Job sometimes you have to do. And a mission is something that, by God's grace, we want to do. Excellent. So, um, let me just read this on the bottom. It is important that congregations are clear about their mission. For a mission provides, yeah, tell me what the French is. I don't know what it is. The reason for existence, that I can read. But I don't do, I don't do French. Uh, even though I came through the era when French was, uh, you know, the real chic thing to do, I don't do French. Um, Meredith, next. So, let me share with you an example that he gives. With this, uh, but first of all, I want to just point out to you that uh, we want to very much keep these words clear and separate as we move forward, a task or job or mission. So uh, the picture that you have here is, the uh, picture in the back is Kentucky Fried Chicken. That could take a while. I'm not familiar with the switches. Yep, not that one. There we go. Only took two tries. Who knew? Who knew? So this is what he says. A silly example. For Kentucky Fried Chicken to function well, there are various tasks and jobs that need to be done. The cooking supplies need to be stocked. You need people who are trained to manage the deep fryers. You need someone to keep the books. You need someone to keep the floors and the bathrooms clean. If any of those tasks or jobs is not done well, it hurts the ability of that particular Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise to function. Your fried chicken experience will not be as delightful, but you will still be able to eat your chicken. Now, if Kentucky Fried Chicken started deep frying bat, and that's the lower right picture, instead of chicken, they are no longer fulfilling their mission. A Kentucky Fried Chicken that sells fried bats might as well not exist. And that's what this reason uh, for mission or reason for existence is all about. All right? Next slide, please. So, 
what we want to look at today is just this concept of mission in the scriptures. And it's interesting that the term actually gets used uh, several times. So you have uh, some Bible passages there from Joshua 22. Uh, let's begin with that. Someone, if you would please read that for us, Joshua 22, verse 1. And you can just read it. Go ahead. Okay, so a couple things in this regard. First of all, it's obviously Joshua who's talking. Uh, it's toward the end of the book of Joshua. So we've, we've already gone through the conquering of the land of Israel. And Joshua is actually speaking here to the soldiers who came from two and a half tribes of Israel. You might remember that the tribes of Reuben and Gad... And half the tribe of Manasseh had very early on, back in the days of Moses, asked if they could settle on the east side of the Jordan River rather than, go, rather than settling on the west side of the Jordan River. Moses had said, you can do that, that's fine. But first, you're going to come with us and you're going to help us fight our battles over here on the west side of the Jordan River between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And when that land has been conquered, then you can go home and settle your land. Well, the conquering has been done. And now Joshua, not Moses, but now Moses' successor, Joshua, has the privilege of telling these men, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you, and namely gave through Moses. That task was done, and now they were ready to go home. Good. Anybody? Second one is 1 Samuel 15, 17 and 18. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, wage war against them until you have wiped them out. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for both of you reading uh, to this far, and we'll look forward to two more uh, reading for us with these passages in just a second. So Samuel here, prophet and judge in Israel, he is the last of the judges of Israel, and he had the privilege of anointing King Saul to be king over Israel. God had selected Saul out of all the people in Israel to be his first king and fully equipped him to be that first king, quite a, quite a challenge. Uh, not that there weren't kings in the area around that Saul could learn from, but there were none who walked with the true God. And in this regard then, Saul was really had to kind of cut out the pattern for being king of God's people uh, all by himself with very little to work on. God gave him the blessing of the Holy Spirit to be able to do all of this and to do it well. Uh, Saul blanched and buckled, however, and quickly fell into um, compromising God's commands. And none more glaring and none more volatile in the reaction from the Lord than what you have here in 1 Samuel 15. This is Samuel coming to Saul after Samuel or Saul was supposed to destroy the Amalekites. These are people that had attacked Israel right after they escaped from Egypt, before they got to Mount Sinai. The Amalekites lived in the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. They heard about these Israelites. They heard they were kind of disorganized, you know, probably not very well equipped, and figured it was easy pickings. So they came and attacked the Israelites. Of course, the Amalekites weren't ready to have to deal with the Lord. And this is that battle where Moses went up on a hillside and raised his hands. You know this battle. And, as long, and whenever he would hold up his hands, the Israelites would be winning. But if his hands got tired and he had to put them down, then the battle would be, the Israelites would start losing. And this is where Aaron and Moses' um, brother, uh, father-in-law, Hur, came. They knelt on the ground and they allowed Moses to rest his arms on their shoulders 
so they could hold them up in Joshua, and the Israelites won a great victory that day. Because they had attacked what they thought were very unsuspecting people and unprepared people, and because they had defied the living God, the Lord put a curse on the Amalekites at that time and said the day would come when they would be wiped from the face of the earth. The day had come. And the one through whom God would bring about this judgment on the Amalekites was King Saul and the Israelites. Only King Saul played fast and loose with God's command and didn't do what he had promised and was thus uh, ultimately rejected as king. And then Saul and Samuel will have the privilege of anointing David. Uh, so did you notice the word mission in there? Sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy these wicked people. Notice what's happening in both of these. Who's doing the sending? You'll catch a pattern. All right? These folks, these folks aren't coming up with this stuff themselves. They're being sent. Acts 12, 25, would you please? When Barnabas and Saul finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. We'll save you, Robin, for Acts 20, 24. Thank you. So this is um, right before Paul goes out on his missionary journey, but he's been working with Barnabas in the north country, in the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea, a place called Antioch, which becomes the center of the early Christian church to the Gentiles. Jerusalem will be the center of the Christian church to the Jews for many years. The Antioch will become the center of the Christian church for the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas were wonderfully blessed in their ministry there by God. The brothers in Antioch decided that they, they heard about the troubles that the Christians in Jerusalem were facing, and they decided to take an offering. Isn't that cool? On their own, they decided to take an offering. And then when they collected the offering, they sent Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to take the offering there. So now they're coming home. In what we just were, what we just heard, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned to Antioch, and they will then soon be sent out. It's interesting that the same Greek word is used in the next one as well, Robin, Acts twenty twenty four. Paul said, "I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me." The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Okay, so once again, the word mission in Acts 12 and the word task in Acts 20, those are the same words in the Greek. So, there's different things going on here. Go down to the bottom of the page. What is the one constant we see in all these passages? I'm sorry. It was a mission from God. Mission from God. That's a great answer to write down uh, for, that, for that question on the bottom of the page. Absolutely and positively. So he has written here, it is probably good to note that Scripture does not give us a working definition of mission. As these passages illustrate, there are a number of different words that are rendered mission in some translations. Moreover, the flavor of those words translated mission is often quite different. However, while Scripture doesn't give us a simple, concise definition of mission, we certainly see the concept. It is an important task that, God, that is given by God himself. In Scripture, a mission is not self-imposed. You don't get to decide your mission. And if you would please turn the page and let's take a look at, at those couple of Bible passages that you have on the top of the page and then we'll move to the conclusion. Anybody? Psalm 119, verse 73. Okay, always a good reminder, huh? 
that we didn't fashion ourselves. God made us. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome. Okay, notice whose church it is. Jesus' church. And who will build it? Jesus will build it. Jesus will build that church. Absolutely. So, a mission statement focuses on the heart of the matter, the heart of the matter. Now, very quickly, think of a miracle of Jesus. And just, you can just say it when you think of it. Water into wine. Water into wine. Great. First one. Raising the dead. Feeding of the 5,000. Feeding of the 5,000. And 4,000. Healing. Healing. And 4,000. And 4,000. Healing people. Call them the storm paralysis. Say it again. Calm the storm. Calming the storm. Walking on water. Walking on water. Excellent. Destroying an olive tree. Say it again. <laughs> Destroying an olive tree. Because it did not <laughs> Yes, he That's did. Very specific. Yes, he did. <laughs> Healing Jairus' daughter. Jairus' daughter. We just heard about that here not long ago. Good. All of these great great examples of the work of Jesus. Looking at that list, well you can't look at it, but listening to that list, would you call any of those Jesus' mission? No, they weren't his mission. Were they a job or a task? Certainly a task, huh? Certainly a task, and certainly part of the job that he'd come to do, but not his mission. Not his mission. Look at Luke 19, verse 10, and Mark 10, 45, and you'll have the summary of Jesus' mission, right? Would you read them, please, for us? Somebody, Luke 19, verse 10. Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save us. And Mark 10, 45. And can we have, is there another slide yet? Or are we done? This is it. Thank you. We have it up there. We, both of these passages, folks, huh? Just an incredible summary. Um, both of them spoken by Jesus. And he himself expresses his mission. And who, folks, sent him? God the Father. Even on a mission to lay down his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, Jesus did not undertake that mission by himself. God the Father so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is how Jesus describes his mission. You see that in that third last bullet uh, towards the bottom of the page. He did not heal the sick or feed the 5,000 or cast out demons because those things were his mission. They were not, but they served his mission. And it is absolutely vital that a congregation distinguish between their God-given mission and good and noble tasks that may serve that mission. Because these tasks may support the mission of the congregation, but may not carry it out or fulfill it. Let me share with you, just in closing, um, some of you go back, like I do, uh, quite a long time ago. And you may recall, uh, back in the late, or you may remember hearing about it, uh, in the late 1940s, um, the Wisconsin Synod had one mission, world mission endeavor, and it had been for 50 years to reach out to our brothers and sisters, our Native American brothers and sisters in Apache land. Uh, the Holy Spirit began stirring the hearts of the folks in the Wisconsin Synod then to begin mission work in some place, in a different place. They sent two men, a guy named Edgar, 
Edgar Heineke and a guy named Art Walker, equipped them with a, with a vehicle that really should have been preserved and kept in a museum someplace, set them down in Africa and had them go on a road trip for a month or so and drive through Africa. And Pastor Heineke and Pastor Walker came back and said, Northern and Southern Rhodesia. Anybody remember those names? So I see a couple heads nodding. You've got to go back a ways for those. Northern and Southern Rhodesia look like beautiful mission opportunities. And so that's where we began our work in Africa, folks, back about 1950. In those two countries, both, I believe, a British, part of the British Empire at that time. They've since gained their independence. Malawi and Zambia is what we know them by today. Almost hand in hand with that early mission endeavor, there were some folks in the Wisconsin Synod who said, the health conditions are deplorable. We must do something about that. And thus began what you and I know today as a Central African Medical Mission. Began with a mobile clinic, another vehicle that should be in a museum someplace, where they drove from village to village to reach out to the folks there with health care, much desperately needed health care, and then also worked out of Lusaka in Zambia as well. It is a beloved mission endeavor, folks. Should be very close to all of our hearts. It has been for, well, how many generations? Couple, three? For the Wisconsin Synod, much, much blessing poured through these dear people who have spent themselves uh, in that work. But never the mission of the mission work in Malawi and Zambia. A very important job, ongoing job, but not the mission. The mission, dear ones, is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to lost souls, to seek and to save. Not to be served ourselves, but to serve and to give our lives also in service to him who is our King and our Lord. Together they have formed the Central African Medical Mission and our African outreach work has formed just an incredible team with wonderful, almost matchless blessing. Very exciting just to hear someone come and talk to, to you for an hour about the work that's ongoing there in, in Central Africa. God be praised. The Lord Jesus is being lifted up, Him who is the light of the world. And bodies and souls both are being cared for through that wonderful, wonderful outreach effort there in Central Africa. Anybody question or comment? We're at 10 o'clock. We have just a closing prayer and blessing and a closing hymn. Let's Can you get these and bring them back or hand them back in? Uh, it would be easiest if we would put them in the mailboxes, in your mailbox uh, out there in the entryway, and then you'll have it there for, for next week. Thanks for asking that again, Galen. All right, I'm going to take my position up here. And if you would please stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace.
live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. And now receive our Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And you may be seated for our closing hymn, our hymn of the month, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire. thank all of you for your participation today in this Bible study. We'll look forward to taking part two uh, when we actually look at developing a mission statement uh, next week, God willing. Uh, there are announcements uh, that you receive either by email or there are copies in the back. I want to just highlight a couple of you uh, just to remind you that the annual meeting is next Sunday after church. I uh, do ask you to please keep Gwen and Marty in your prayers. Thank you so much for the love and support that you've shown to both of those gals. And uh, we're really, really happy to see you back here in church with us, Marty. That's really a treat. Makes the day worth it all by its onesie. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, on the back of the um, um, announcements, there is a, a fairly lengthy comment on the Lutheran Convention for Seniors, sponsored by Owls. It'll be this uh, coming October, uh, October 19 to 22 at MLC, and uh, Best Western Plus there in New, Ul New Ulm. How did that ever become two symbols, I wonder? Isn't that something? People say it, all, right? All the time, people say it, New Ulm. Anyway. Uh, that's where it'll be, and you have the information uh, there. Sounds like a pretty neat deal, and uh, sounds like it's going to be in person, which will be kind of a neat thing, huh? coming out of COVID. God bless you folks. Thanks for being here today. Have a great day in Jesus.